Questions, questions around. The owner member for Barry in this bill. Canadians have been hearing about a massive Liberal overreach into their personal banking information, and for four days, the Liberals have been defending it as though accessing line-by-line, -line, transaction by transaction details of my mother and father's bank account without their consent is normal behaviour. If foreign governments tried this, they would be accused of hacking into my mum and dad's account. Why do the Liberals think it's okay to hack into Canadian bank accounts and take personal data without their consent? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Innovation, Science and uh, De uh, Economic Development. Madam Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Our government takes the privacy of Canadians very seriously, but I need to correct a few things in his discourse. First of all, this is a pilot project, Madam Speaker. Currently in the design stage, no data has been collected to date. And it's Statistics Canada that is uh, uh, gathering the data, or would be gathering the data, not the government. And Statistics Canada's job is precisely to provide good data that is reliable and necessary to meet the needs of all Canadians, other, all Canadian levels of government, municipal governments, the federal government, provincial governments. They've done this for 100 years, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Barry Innisville. They've been defending this for four days. That's right. What a backtrack, Mr. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Totally. This is a personal violation of every Canadian, and Canadians have no faith or trust in this Liberal government and how they will use that data. And why, Madam Speaker? Over the past 19 months, there have been hundreds of thousands of examples of privacy breaches by this Liberal government. Canadians are rightly cynical, and they won't stand for this intrusion into their personal lives. Why are the Liberals supporting this gross violation into the privacy of Canadians. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, Statistics Canada as an institution has an exemplary record of gathering the, the personal information of Canadians. They've been doing it for 100 years. They have been doing it in a safe and secure fashion, and they will continue to do so. The reports that Statistics Canada puts out, Madam Speaker, are important to Canadians of, uh, in all walks of life in terms of how they plan their personal lives for governments, municipal governments, provincial governments, the federal government to create good policy, institutions such as the Bank of Canada. Statistics Canada performs a necessary role. We will continue to defend their ability to do so, and they are respecting the privacy of Canadians. Our member for Barry Innisville. And now they're hiding behind Statistics Canada when it was their idea to invest invade Canadian privacy. This is why the personal violation and breach of the trust becomes important. If mum or dad transfers $15,000 to their son and daughter-in-law to help with the purchase of their first home, should they expect a call from the government asking them why? Will the government call a new Canadian after they transfer money back home to their family in the Philippines asking what that transfer was for? The potential for abuse is real. This personal violation of privacy is wrong on every level. Why can't this Liberal government see that? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, no government and no Canadian will have access to the personal information of Canadians. It will end with Statistics Canada, who will keep it in a secure fashion. What, what governments do get, what other institutions will get, what other Canadians will get are Statistics Canada reports, which are relied on by Canadians, by members of Parliament, by other governments across Canada, and have been for 100 years. Statistics Canada has worked with the Privacy Commissioner on this pilot project from the get-go. It will continue to do so, Madam Speaker, in respect of the privacy of Canadians. Canadians do not need to be worried, Madam Speaker, about their information. Honourable Member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Madam Speaker, the situation is clear for millions of Canadians. Statistics Canada has no business snooping into the bank accounts of Canadians. That's clear. Pilot project or, or not, th that's a fundamental principle that we defend. Yes, Statistics Canada's consultations, but they're doing it, they normally do it with the consent of Canadians. And in this case, Canadians are having their bank accounts snooped into without their consent. It makes no sense. Why are the Liberals still doing the indefensible? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, our government takes privacy issues very seriously. Let's be clear, this is a pilot project that is currently in the design phase. No data has been collected to date. The work of StatsCan is to provide reliable and necessary data to meet the needs of Canadians, companies and communities. By working on designing this project, 
StatsCan has worked from the very beginning with the Privacy Commissioner. And StatsCan will continue to do so. The Deputy the Honorable Member for Louis Saint-Laurent. Well, Madam Speaker, the problem is that this is a pilot project. Could the government uh, uh, make the pilot land the plane? Because this doesn't make any sense. Now, there may be breaches of confidentiality here. That's the problem. Over the last 19 months in Canada, there have been over a thousand situations where there were confidentiality breaches and where private information was leaked. That's over a thousand in 19 months. How can we tr trust this so-called pilot project? The Honorable pa uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, for 100 years, Statistics Canada has been collecting Canadians' data. They have been doing so in an exemplary manner. Reliable, high-quality data is essential if we are to make decisions that truly reflect the needs of Canadians. Unlike the Conservatives, Madam Speaker, we believe that facts are a very good starting point for public policy, not ideology. I know that the Conservatives like to base their decisions on ideology, but we will base our decisions as a government on facts. Honourable Member for Courtney Alberney. Madam Speaker, veterans have fought hard for this country and deserve nothing but respect from our government. But when the Liberal government allocated funds for veterans, we expected these funds to be spent. The government is doing what it said it would never do, authorize funds for veterans and fail to use them. The Liberals are not honouring their promise to respect veterans and to make sure every dime allocated is spent. This is unacceptable. When will the Liberals show veterans the respect they deserve and make sure that every dollar allocated by this House House is spent. The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs and Associate Minister to the National Defence. Madam Speaker, our benefits are demand driven, so whether there are 10 veterans or whether 10,000 eligible veterans come forward, they receive benefits. And they are based on en estimates, and they provide us some guarantees. Whether a veteran comes forward this year or the next year or the year after, we will always have the resources available for veterans. When we took office, we immediately increased financial supports by putting more money in veterans' pockets, increasing mental health supports, delivering on the promises that we made to veterans and their families. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Jean Pierre. Madam Speaker, the Liberals make promises to our veterans that they can't even keep. They authorize spending, but they're not getting the money out the door. They left $80.9 million sitting in coffers in 2016, $143 million in 2017, and $148.6 million in 2018. Without this money, veterans don't have access to the services they are entitled to. Will the Liberals finally keep their promises, or will they abandon our veterans? The Honourable Minister. Madam Speaker, uh, the benefits defend depend on the uh, number of requests. All ed eligible veterans will receive these benefits. We estimate the number of people who will make a request for benefits uh, will be dealt with. The Honourable Member for Jean-Pierre. Madam Speaker, for the men and women working in steel mills in Hamilton or in small businesses in Saguenay-Lac-Saint-Jean, the USMCA negotiations are not just a game to be won. The Americans' unfair steel and aluminum tariffs could make them lose their jobs, and they could cause serious harm to my region. Workers should always be kept informed of the status of trade negotiations. Will the government commit not to sign this agreement until the tariffs are scrapped? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. Madame la Présidente. Madam Speaker, these unfair and illegal tariffs harm the American economy as well as American consumers and workers. The excuse of uh, citing national security reasons is absurd. That's why we have reciprocated with uh, proportionate measures. Canada needs to stand united in these attacks against our workers. For, for Victoria. A report out this week says that over the last 25 years, the Earth's oceans have retained 60% more heat than scientists had thought. Also this week, a glacier in Antarctica lost a section of ice five times the size of Manhattan. But the Liberals don't seem to get the urgency of climate change. They think following Harper's targets is just fine. Our oceans are warming, 
Our icebergs are melting. We need urgent action now. Why don't the Liberals ditch their grossly inadequate plan and come up with something consistent with the urgency of climate change? Mr. Secretary, to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his concern for a great challenge of our time, and that's the challenge that we face in respect of climate change. Uh, the results of the recent IPCC report are not lost on me nor on our government. I was very proud when our government and the Minister of Environment and Climate Change played a key role in facilitating the agreement in Paris that led us to set forth a plan that's going to allow us to make a meaningful difference to reduce our emissions. Ms. Madam Speaker, we know that after this, uh, this plan is implemented, we may have to do more after that, and I look forward to working with members from all parties to continue to fight this uh, existential challenge. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Nicola. Madam Speaker, another day has gone by with the Liberals refusing to actually listen to Canadians, putting aside the hundreds of pages of privacy breaches by the government. The state does not have the right to monitor law-abiding citizens going about their daily lives. Full stop, Madam Speaker. Will the Liberals accept that people are rightfully concerned and end this unprecedented surveillance scheme? Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, we understand that privacy is important to Canadians. That's why we have taken measures to protect Canadians' privacy in this matter and in a number of different places. Nobody, Madam Speaker, will have access to the personal nominative information that Canadians give to, to Statistics Canada. Indeed, Madam Speaker, Statistics Canada cannot even be compelled to give that information to a court of law. It is, it is protected in this their hands. Madam Speaker, we, Statistics Canada has policies and procedures in place to protect the privacy of Canadians, and we need all Canadians need this. member for Central Okanagan, Samilkami Nicola. Madam Speaker, speaking about privacy, we're talking about millions of records that could potentially impact millions of Canadians. And the Privacy Commissioner is concerned. And speaking about the Privacy Commissioner, yesterday he said, and I quote, privacy is not a right to be traded off in exchange for innovation. Right. He also said the current law allows the government to seek this information without anyone's consent. Wow. The information in Canadians' bank accounts Madam Speaker, belongs to them, right. not the Liberals. Will the government finally listen to Canadians and end this Orwellian program? Yeah. Uh, Parliamentary Secretary. Speaker, let me correct something the Honourable Member is saying. The government is not accessing the dominative data of Canadians. Statistics Canada is for all Canadians to be able to use. The personal information gets protected. And once the information gets processed by Statistics Canada, it is available for the use of municipal governments. It's available for the use of provincial governments, the federal government, small businesses, Madam Speaker, individual Canadians, the Bank of Canada, other institutions and other individuals that have to make decisions in their lives, economic decisions, based on the best available information. Madam Speaker, it's... The Honourable Member for Banff, Airdrie. Well, Madam Speaker, these Liberals just keep saying, Nothing to see here. Move along, folks. But if there was really nothing to hide, then why didn't they just tell Canadians in the first place that they were collecting this information? Yeah. Now, we're talking about things like Canadians' ATM withdrawals, their credit card transactions, and their bill payments. The first step to fixing a problem is actually admitting that you have a problem. So will the Liberals stop trying to sweep this under the carpet and admit that trying to steal Canadians' data without their consent is a real problem? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, let me once again correct the narrative. Uh, this was a pilot project that, was still, that is still in the process of being designed. From the beginning, Statistics Canada has, has been open to working with the Privacy Commissioner, has in fact had privacy, commission, had privacy concerns uh, protected from the get-go. Madam Speaker, they invited the Privacy Commissioner to take a look at what they were doing, and that is they are going to move ahead uh, with the Privacy Commissioner in order to ensure that the privacy of Canadians is protected. Madam Speaker, those are the facts. We, we take the privacy of Canadians seriously. I'll remember for Red Deer Mountain View. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, if this was a, uh, a pilot project, then why did the Privacy Commissioner launch a full investigation? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, Madam Speaker, if they're so proud of this, they certainly should have been uh, announcing this publicly. The Prime Minister once expressed his admiration for basic dictatorship. Is this where he got the idea to start tracking every purchase that we make? Here, here. Our Parliamentary Secretary. 
Madam Speaker, it's a bit rich for the other side uh, to, to try to criticize an institution such as Statistics Canada regarding privacy concerns. It is, was, in fact, their government, Madam Speaker, under Vic Taves, that tried, to, that tried to have everyone tell Vic Taves what they were doing every day, right? Tell Vic everything. Madam Speaker, that was their government trying to do that. In this case, it is not our government. It is not any government gathering information. It is Statistics Canada. They do it reasonably, and they, they do it effectively and protecting the privacy of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Oshawa. Madam Speaker, this Liberal government will be collecting personal, financial and banking information without consent from Canadians. That includes seniors, mums and small businesses in my community of Oshawa. This is not anonymized information. It includes debit and credit card transactions, bill payments, mortgage payments, even trips to Tim Hortons and Oshawa General Games will be handed over to this leaky Liberal government line by line without Canadians' knowledge or consent. Will this big brother Liberal government do the right thing and respect the privacy of Canadians instead of incorporating them into the plot of 1984? Yeah. 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 Madam Speaker, nothing could be further from the truth. The government will not have access to this information. The first thing that Statistics Canada does is scrubs all the personal information from the data so it becomes anonymous. Then they repackage that data for a variety of different Canadians to use in a variety of different ways. It is not a question of surveillance, Madam Speaker. Statistics Canada has an exemplary repu reputation in Canada. It is seen as a leader around the world in, in statistical gathering and statistical methods. They will continue to do this to the highest standard and to the highest standard of privacy. The Honourable Member for Lethbridge. Madam Speaker, here's the deal. We have Canadians who are having their bank accounts snooped through by this government. We're talking about transaction records, we're talking about bill payments, we're talking about bank balances, we're talking about social insurance numbers. Now the Parliamentary Secretary is saying this, he's saying, don't worry Canadians, we're not keeping it, we're sharing it, we're sharing it, we're repackaging it, we're giving it away as a gift, so don't worry right. Canadians, it's, it's okay that we're collecting your personal data. Yep. Madam Speaker, in what world is that okay? Yeah. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, as a government, we rely on data. Other Canadians rely on data. The Bank of Canada, small businesses, other levels of Canadian government, municipal governments. For 100 years, Madam Speaker, Statistics Canada has done that job of collecting the data of Canadians and of making it available for Canadians to use to make better decisions. We are not, this is not a surveillance exercise, Madam Speaker. This is an exercise in providing Canadians with the information that they need to run their lives. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Windsor West. Canadians are appalled to learn that Statistics Canada plans to access their detailed personal banking information. They were never consulted and they didn't consent. Like Apple or Facebook, the Liberal government fails the fundamental pr uh, principle of consent for privacy. Building a massive database of personal banking information without telling one is just wrong. This banking data breach is on the tip of the spear of the new Liberal Census Canada scheme. It's not a pilot project, it's the actual new regime they've put in place. Will the government halt this from running wild in their data collection until it's investigated, there's consultations, and consent is obtained? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Madam Speaker, I, I thank the Honourable Member for his question. I thank him for his work on the Indu Committee, and like him, I share his concern with the privacy of Canadians. Madam Speaker, some of the information that Statistics Canada uh, will, will gather is, of interesting infor is, is interesting to that side of the House. For example, in 2017, Statistics Canada reported that, that Canadians were spending more than 30 per cent of their income on housing. And that led us, Madam Speaker, to develop uh, a, a social housing policy in Canada that will address the issue. It is these kinds of, of statistics and data that will help Canadians of all stripes. The Honourable Member for Census and Begut. Madam Speaker, since the latest Liberal agreement, millions of tons of American chicken, eggs and turkey are ready to enter the Canadian market. 
Pierre-Luc Leblanc, the president of the Quebec Poultry Farmers Association, says that while this may appear harmless today, in five or ten years, it may seriously start harming poultry producers. Farmers are surprised and disappointed by this agreement and are asking for strong compensatory measures from the government. So on their behalf, I ask the Minister of Agriculture and the Prime Minister, when will they listen to what farmers have to say? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Madam Speaker, we've defended our supply management system and the Americans' aggressive uh, efforts to uh, dismantle it did not work. Changes were negotiated under the TPP. The minister announced the creation this Monday of working uh, groups with uh, dairy producers as well as poultry and egg producers, and we are committed to fully supporting them to help them continue to thrive. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Madam Speaker, the government admits that its new carbon tax will add at least 11 cents a litre to Canadians when they gas up their car, but a government analysis quietly posted online this week showed that after the next election, they plan to increase that tax even further. How much? Well, an earlier ministerial briefing note said it would have to go up six times as high as the government currently admits, and one UN report cited today by the government says it would have to be a hundred times higher than the government is currently admitting. Will the government today confirm it will not increase the tax after the election? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, climate change is real, and those of us who have a platform in this House have a responsibility to do something about it. We campaign on a commitment to protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time. Part of our plan to protect the environment includes putting a price on pollution that's going to actually see polluters pay more and make middle-class families better off. I'm curious uh, when the Conservatives are actually going to come up with their plan, because so far as I can see it, their only plan to date is to make pollution free again. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, the Liberal plan does make pollution free for large polluters. They don't pay the tax. But back to the question. The government admits that it will increase taxes on gas per litre by 11 cents. But a document released this week says that in 2022, after the election's over, they plan to increase it further. One ministerial a briefing note says that would have to go up six times what the government promises. That's 60 cents a litre. A UN report cited by the government says it would have to go up 100 times more than the government admits, $10 a litre in new taxes. Will the government confirm whether it will increase the tax further. The uh, member, uh, Parliamentary Secretary, Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Madam Speaker, again, we were elected on a commitment to protect the environment and uh, grow the economy at the same time. We've been transparent with our plan to put a price on pollution that will increase over time by 2022 to being $50 a tonne. Madam Speaker, again, I'm curious why the Conservatives refuse to put forward a plan and instead of actually coming forward with productive ideas in the conversation, seem committed to adopting the approach taken by Doug Ford in Ontario, which is to do absolutely nothing. Right. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Uh, Madam, Madam Speaker, I ask twice now whether or not the 11 cent a litre tax the government promised is the final price. And twice that member has refused to answer. Mm -hmm. That suggests this government has a hidden agenda yeah. right. to increase the tax even more than it already has admitted. This document released this week does not even talk about increased rebates, just increased taxes. Will the, will the parliamentary secretary confirm if the tax will ever go above 11 cents a litre per ga for gas? Our parliamentary secretary. Madam Speaker, again, part of our plan to protect the environment, which is essential for those of us in government to take seriously, is to put a price on pollution that's increasing to $50 a tonne by 2022. This is going to have the impact of putting more money into the pockets of middle class families. And I'm extraordinarily disappointed that the Conservatives seem committed to campaign in 2019 on a promise to take money from their constituents so they can make pollution free again. The Honourable Member for Carleton. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep on this. I think we've got them on the run here, uh, Madam Speaker. He refuses to answer the question. He's now, he said that by 2022 they'll have a price of $50 a tonne, which is 11 cents a litre for a litre of gas. Now, I've asked, given the evidence, whether they plan to increase it further if they're re-elected. He keeps dodging. Will he end the hidden agenda? and confirm yes or no, will the tax rise above 
11 cents a litre for gas. Yes or no? We are coming to Secretary. Madam Speaker, again, we have to take yes. protecting the environment seriously. The only plan we put in place is the one we've been telling Canadians about for a, a significant period of time now, which is to have the price on pollution that we've laid out in public leading up to 2022. Madam Speaker, I'd like to take this opportunity to reiterate that all the revenues generated from this are going back to the citizens who live in the provinces where it's collected, and it's going to have more money put into the pockets of middle-class families. One final time, Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to, uh, to share that I'm disappointed Pointed, and the Conservatives that they seem committed to campaigning on a promise to take that money from their constituents to make pollution free again. The Honourable Member for Saskatoon West. Madam Speaker, Canada's post targeting of vulnerable postal workers is shameful. First, they cut off short term disability payments, then long term disability payments, then they went after people's maternity leave benefits. This is a morally bankrupt tactic by Canada Post, and so far the government has chosen to be complicit. Cutting benefits is not good faith collective bargaining. What is this government doing to stop this brutal assault on workers' rights and encourage Canada Post to bargain in good faith? The Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for her question so I can clarify. We understand absolutely the impact the work disruption is having on employees and their families. That's why our government has been encouraging both sides to reach a fair agreement as soon as possible. Unfortunately, when a strike occurs, the expiry of collective agreement affects some of the benefits of Canada Post employees, but not all. And I'll give you an example. Prescription drug, for example, will continue for our employees. And I can assure this House that, in fact, employees will maintain full access to their EI benefits, which includes maternity and parental benefits. And Canada Post has put in place uh, a request for a compassionate ground exception to this, and they're taking those requests seriously and addressing them very quickly. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Hamilton Mountain. Madam Speaker, I don't know how many times we need to stand in this House to make this government understand that our workers' pensions are vulnerable mm -hmm. under bankruptcy laws. Steel workers are disappointed to see the lack of will from the seniors minister to take action. She has not taken their, their livelihood or their years of hard work seriously. They deserve better. Now that three years have passed, can she tell us what is she waiting for? When will the minister get to work to change the bankruptcy laws and to stand for workers and retirees? This is the right thing to do. Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Seniors. Madam Speaker, the accusations made by the member are completely inaccurate and wrong. There is not a file that's closer to my heart than this one. From the day I was elected, I have been working on this. As the daughter of a proud steelworker and a lifelong Hamiltonian, I can tell you that this file is extremely important. And consultations have been and will continue to take place. In our 2018 budget, as well as my mandate letter, I've been tasked with this. I have consulted. I will continue to consult. The member knows this is a decades-old problem, and it's our government that's going to solve it. And no matter what Ms information he gives won't stop me or our Honourable member for Dartmouth Cold Harbour. Madam Speaker, it's hockey season and kids of all ages in Dartmouth Cold Harbour and in fact across the whole country are buying new gear and hitting the ice. Now as a hockey dad I know very well the parents want to make sure that their kids are safe and I know that concussions are of great concern to parents. Could the Minister of Science and Sport please tell us what our government is doing to make sports in Canada safer and to perhaps reduce concussions. Good question. The Honourable Minister of Science and Sports. I'd like to thank the member for Dartmouth Coal Harbour for his important question. Our government takes sport-related concussion very seriously. Far too many youth and athletes experience concussion during sport and recreation activities. That's why we've released the new Canadian con guideline on concussion in sport and are working to harmonize an approach on concussion awareness, prevention, detection, management and surveillance. We are pleased that Parliament's Health Committee has created a subcommittee to study concussion and we look forward to their work and their report. The member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles, Miss. Madam Speaker, the Minister for Border Security does not realize that the number of illegal migrants is increasing in Canada, yet the RCMP's numbers are available to his officials and policy advisors. Even the media have confirmed this. For three, year now, for three years now, we've been saying that we have to do something now. Either the minister is receiving bad advice or is he simply incompetent? Is he finally going to act or will we have to do the minister's job? 
the Honorable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Border Security. Thank you, Madam Speaker. What is incompetent is cutting $400 million from border services and to think that the, we can get the same results. Let me tell you something, something to my honorable colleague. We've invested $173 million to make sure we have resources on the ground to do the job. August and in August and September, we've seen lower numbers than last year. We hope it'll be the same for October. It clearly shows that our plan is working, Madam Speaker. The member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles, Madam Speaker, if they had not created the problem, we wouldn't have to reinvest money. But now things are worse than ever before. They boast that they reinvested money in border services, but the president of the Guard, border Guards Unions, Jean-Pierre Fortin, doesn't seem to agree because right now he has not received a penny for his border guards. The money is somewhere in the department, but it's not on the ground. So can you give us a smart answer? Tell us, um, stop telling us we're wrong. Where's the money? The Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. These are the facts. We have invested $173 million to better manage the situation. Over $7 million of that money is in place to make sure that asylum seekers whose application has been rejected will be uh, deported. This is what Canadians expect from us, and this is exactly what we're doing. And possibly one of the worst interviews ever given. Yesterday, the Minister of Immigration once again angrily called his Ontario provincial counterpart several inappropriate names after she requested federal support to pay for the social welfare costs of the Prime Minister's hashtag welcome to Canada illegal border crossers. When pressed on what evidence he had to support the name he called her, he got even more angry and doubled down. Will the Minister apologize for his name calling and shameful disregard for all Ontario taxpayers? The Honourable Minister of Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship. Speaker, our government has uh, been going around the country to talk to Canadians about how much immigration matters to them in their local communities. We know that Canadians have been asking for uh, immigration to be an important tool to address uh, labour market shortages as well as bring much needed skills. I know that after three years in opposition, my honourable colleague has finally discovered the importance of talking to Canadians about uh, immigration. And uh, with uh, all the blocking of people that she's done on Twitter, I hope this will be the last uh, way that she can communicate with Canadians. Honourable member for Calgary knows I will take that as a no, but let's try again. And you know what, I'm not sure if the minister watched that interview, but he really should, because it was really a hot mess. Um, but this isn't about his lack of media training. This is about positive federal-provincial relationships to come up with good public policy solutions. Will the minister humble himself and apologize to one of the strongest women I know, Lisa McLeod, for his shameful, inappropriate name-calling and outbursts? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable uh, Minister of uh, Immigration, uh, 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 it's uh, that immigration continues to be a tool for Canadians to address labour market shortages. We rely on immigration to make sure that we continue to be a leader in the uh, G7 in terms of making sure that we uh, investment follows talent. We've attracted uh, a huge number of uh, skilled labour through the global skills strategy and the changes we made to the uh, express entry system. Uh, the announcements that we made yesterday with our new multi-year plan will ensure that Canada continues to prosper through immigration, a lesson that the, the, the party opposite uh, wished to learn. The Honourable Member for Nanaimo, ladies. Vancouver Aquarium Research just warned that climate change threatens our coast even more than before. Climate plans fall well short of what's needed. Oceans are warming and sea levels rising much faster than anticipated. Alarm bells are ringing for our coast. But this government just bought a leaky old pipeline. The government just called this an existential crisis. Isn't the government embarrassed to still be using Harper's discredited climate change targets? The Honourable Prime Minister, Secretary to the Minister of Environment uh, Speaker, and Climate Change. It's, it's my pleasure to rise to, uh, to once again offer a response on this very important issue of climate change. I'm aware of the, uh, the evidence that the, uh, the Honourable Member Office cites and take this problem very, very seriously. We played an integral role at the Paris Conference in achieving an agreement that was actually going to meaningfully move the needle on the fight against climate 
climate change. In order to implement our plan domestically and reach our targets, we're putting a price on pollution. We're investing in clean energy. We're helping small businesses become more efficient. Ms. Madam Speaker, it is a pleasure to be part of this government that takes this threat seriously. And we have to know we have to work to grow the economy at the same time. And I'm pleased to work with the member across the aisle to uh, move the needle forward on both of these initiatives. Our member for Edmonton, Strathcona. Madam Speaker, revelations of the staggering scale of liabilities and the hundreds of billions for cleanup of mines and well sites has stunned Canadians. But for those who have long called for full disclosure of the true cost of reclamation of industrial sites in advance of project approvals, this comes as no surprise. The federal government holds the power to prevent downloading of this massive liability. I call in this government to act now on Alberta's demands. Amend the federal bankruptcy and creditor laws and give higher priority to environmental cleanup to end the downloading of liability to Canadians. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Natural Resources. Madam Speaker, we know it is critical for Canada's resources to be developed in a sustainable way so that economic growth and environmental protections go hand in hand. Provinces manage their own environmental liabilities. They are responsible for having the tools to mitigate potential risks associated with upstream oil and gas development. Our government works with provinces and territories to support their regulatory regimes and share best practices. In Budget 2017, we made a $30, a $30 million investment which supported Alberta's efforts to advance the reclamation of orphan wells. While this important task remains with the province, we have been able to show our support. The Honourable Member for uh, Edmonton West. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Madam Speaker, the President of the Treasury Board has tried to downplay his ties to Irving, claiming that he only, was only copied on one letter. But according to the lobbyist registry, he has met with Irving 16 times in the past two and a half years. So does the President of the Treasury Board still want to claim that he's had little contact with Irving, or perhaps his meetings with Irvings were just part of a pilot project? Yeah. <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, the uh, I presume the honourable gentleman's question uh, relates to the uh, uh, the issues that are presently before the courts. Uh, there is uh, an outstanding legal proceeding before the courts uh, and between the prosecution and uh, and Admiral Norman. Uh, the parties to that proceeding will seek disclosure of documents. That's routine. If any of those relevant documents are in the possession of the government, the government will provide them to the court, but it's up to the court to decide, not the House of Commons, and the court will determine how to apply any rules with respect to privilege or confidence. The Honourable uh, Member for Edmonton West. It sounds like he's confirmed the President of the Treasury Board as part of the court action. Mm, now, Madam Speaker, the President of the Treasury Board claims that he interfered with the Davy Ship deal as part of his job to oversee spending. Yet in, in committee yesterday, he was not able to name one other contract that he thought was part of his job to review, not even the failed Phoenix pay system. Why did he only interfere with the Davy deal, and what is he trying to hide? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the, uh, the Honourable Minister, sorry. No. The Honourable no. Minister. No. Uh, ma ma Madam Speaker, uh, again, the, uh, the, the tactic for being employed by the opposition is uh, to, uh, to drive by with, uh, with smears and innuendos. That's the very reason why we have the sub rule in the House of Commons, that members of Parliament should not ask questions and ministers should not answer questions that could somehow impinge upon an outstanding court proceeding. The court will determine what documents are relevant. The court will determine what rules of privilege and confidence apply. The court has the jurisdiction in this matter. Member for Lakeland. Madam Speaker, Liberals always put criminals ahead of victims and law-abiding Canadians. Tori Stafford's killer was transferred from jail to a healing lodge on their watch. Today, her loved ones are gathering to call for action, demanding that child killers be kept behind bars, not in healing lodges without fences. But so far, the Liberals refuse to act. Canadians are outraged about it. What is taking so long, and when will the Liberals actually do the right thing and put Tory's killer back behind bars where she belongs? The Honourable uh, Minister of Public Safety Mr. and... Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, all members of this House would share the deep angst of the families who have tragically lost children to crime. And that's why 
I, I asked for a thorough review by the Corrections Commissioner to ensure long-standing policy in these matters has been followed and to reassess the appropriateness of, uh, of those policies to determine uh, that they are, in fact, the, uh, the right ones. Uh, the report was uh, made available uh, uh, late yesterday, Madam Speaker. I am reviewing it at the moment. Uh, we all want this system to be as good as it can possibly be for the protection of the public. Member for Vimy. Madame la Présidente. The member for Vimy. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Minister for Employment, Workforce Development and Labour announced amendments to the Canada Labour Code. We all heard about what happened to the Sears workers, and in my writing, these workers were affected as well. Middle class Canadians felt hard done by, by conservative policies, which only benefited the most well off. Can the parliamentary, sector, uh, parliamentary Secretary inform this House what this government is doing for the middle class families in my riding? The Minister of Employment, Workforce Development and Labour. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I'd like to thank the member for Vimy for her uh, question and for her hard work on behalf of those Sears workers. Uh, and it was great. We can all agree here in this House that uh, Canadians benefit when there's growth in the economy. Where we differ here from the Conservative opposition is that we don't believe it should take place. Any growth should take place on the backs of workers. We want workers to get a fair shake in this country. And that's why we announced yesterday the doubling of the benefits in the Wage Earner Protection Program. And that will benefit the workers, her Sears workers, and that. I'm, I'm proud to be part of a government that actually takes action for Canadian workers. The RO member for Sturgeon River Parkland. Madam Speaker, this week we learned that the Liberal government would give a carbon tax exemption to New Brunswick's Beldoon coal facility. Now, the Liberals have admitted that their carbon tax on large emitters will kill jobs. But the fact is, is that this carbon tax is already costing jobs in my community. Why does this Liberal government give exemptions to Liberal ridings while punishing hard-working Canadians? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary for the Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. Madam Speaker, we look forward to working with the government of New Brunswick to protect our environment and grow our economy. New Brunswickers, like all Canadians, know that we need to take action on climate change. That's something that my Conservative friends haven't yet realized, Madam Speaker. Right. That's we right. will continue to work with the government of New Brunswick and our Liberal New Brunswick caucus, of which we are very proud, to promote right. clean growth, to strengthen the middle class, and to continue to delivering for all Canadians. Exactly. Oh, no, no. That the Honourable Member for Fleetwood Port Kells. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Our government knows the importance of taking action to protect our species and wildlife, and that's why this week we're taking unprecedented new measures to further help the recovery of BC southern resident killer whales. The new measures include $143 million invested in critical steps to protect this West Coast icon. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment please further explain the steps the government is taking to protect our southern resident killer whales? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, member for Fleetwood Port Kells for raising this important issue and his advocacy to protect this iconic species. We take our role to protect the southern resident killer whale very, very seriously, and that's why I was incredibly proud to stand aside the Minister of Transportation and the Minister for Fisheries and Oceans this week to announce new measures to protect this species. These uh, measures include an investment of $61.5 million that includes funding to support marine habit restoration. And importantly, we're also going to be strengthening control on five harmful contaminants that we know has an impact on this species at times when their food resource is scarce and interferes with their reproduction. We're going to continue to protect nature and wildlife, and they, these species depend upon it. The Honourable Member for Calgary, Rocky Ridge. Madam Speaker, the Minister of Revenue keeps claiming that service is prior her priority, yet under her watch, service continues to get even worse, despite the budget increase. She's been picking on single parents. She hasn't, start, she hasn't reviewed all the disability tax credits she took away. She's taken no meaningful action on offshore evadence, uh, avoidance and ev evasion. Wait times are getting longer, and the call centre is still a disaster. So will this minister stop claiming that service is pr her priority and start delivering service to Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Revenue. Madam Speaker, my colleague across is talking about is comparing apples with oranges. Uh, the fight against tax evasion, especially tax evasion abroad, is a priority for us, as well as providing good service to Canadians. They have no lessons to give us on this side of the House. They 
cut funding for Revenue Canada, and we are working to fix the problems. People will receive the benefits they are entitled to. The Honourable Member for Joliette. Big news. Yesterday, the government announced that the Davy Shipyard would not be building any ships and would only receive in 2021, a maintenance contract worth less than 2% of the shipbuilding strategy. Irving and C-SPAN are experiencing delay after delay, and the Asterix is the only ship which has been delivered to the government. Davy, the best shipbuilder in America, delivered on time and on budget. Yesterday, despite the success of the Asterix, the government is dragging its feet on awarding it the Obelix, whereas the wealthy Irvings are being given risk-free guarantees. Can the minister tell us why he is undermining the Davy shipyard? The Honourable Member for uh, Public Service and Procurement. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We recognize the excellent work carried out by the Davy Shipyard. Yesterday, we awarded a $7 billion contract to all three shipyards, including the Davy Shipyard. They also received significant funding to build icebreakers. We are Still working with Davy, and uh, at this point here, the minister decided he doesn't need a second operational vessel, so we are continuing to work for all Canadians in shipbuilding. The Honourable Member for Joliet. We're still talking about only 2% of the contract. This week, we learned that when Governors General ended their well-paid mandates eating hors d'oeuvre at taxpayer expense. Well, after their mandate, they still get their office expenses paid for life. Adrian Clarkson alone is costing us over $100,000 a year, even 10 years after her retirement. Will the government disclose all of the details of the paid back expenses of every single governor general, including those of Mikael Jean, whose shenanigans we've heard about too? Mr. Fisheries, Oceans and the Canadian Coast Guard. Madam Speaker, Canadians can be proud to be represented by Governors General as inspiring and dynamic. They are providing great service to Canadians, and that's why they benefit from support in the years following the end of their mandate. It is clear that Canadians expect transparency and accountability when public funds are spent. We are going to take a close look at this file. And we will ensure that best practices are followed and in order to meet the expectations of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mirabel. Madam Speaker, we know that a Governor General does, does not serve much purpose, so why should taxpayers pay for them? But it's beyond the pale that their office expenses are paid for the rest of their lives. And these aristocrats don't even have to justify the expenses. The Prime Minister said he expects greater transparency. So will he open the books instead of opening his pocket book to these parasites? Madam Speaker, as I've just said, we are very proud of our Governors General who represent our country. We are in the process of reviewing the policy on expenses to ensure a level of transparency which uh, Canadians expect. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sanish Gulf Islands. Madam Speaker and friends, a month from today, the climate negotiations will begin in Poland at COP24. The agenda will be the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees and a review of every government's actions and whether we're on track. We know that some countries have done a huge amount, but collectively we're off course. We are headed for the risk of global extinction. This is not a joke. We are running out of time. We have one chance, one chance only. Can Canada show leadership and go accepting the target 45 degrees by 2030, or do we give up on our children? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment uh, and Madam Climate Speaker, Change. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member from Saanich Gulf Islands for her question today and for her work on this file over the past number of decades. Uh, this is a threat that we need to take extraordinarily seriously, and I've read through the IPCC report and know that we need to take action and take action immediately. Madam Speaker, we campaign on a commitment to protect the environment that included putting a price on pollution and a number of other measures. We played a key role in facilitating the agreement at Paris, and our government is committed to making our targets. If we need to do more after that, Madam Speaker, I'd be be pleased to continue to work with the honourable member to protect our environment for our kids and grandkids.